Good morning and welcome to Butzel Long's webinar, Executive Orders on COVID-19, What Healthcare Providers Need to Know, presented to the Michigan Ambulatory Surgery Association members and the healthcare community. We would like to take a moment to thank the MASA board for giving us this opportunity to present and to share this critical information with both your members and all of our attendees joining this webinar. We'll be covering a lot of ground during this morning's presentation, but please feel free to submit questions to our presenters using the GoToWebinar questions panel. Our presenters will answer as many questions as they can at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Also, a copy of the presentation will be made available this afternoon on the webinar event page and on the Butzel Long Coronavirus Resource Center on Butzel.com. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I would like to introduce Butzel Long shareholder, Deb Giroux. Deb? Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks to all the attendees for getting up early um, and listening to what no one really wants to hear, um, but everyone needs to know about the various executive orders and what's going on in the government today with the coronavirus um, pandemic happening. The information that we are going to present today is as it as it exists as of yesterday. Um, as many of you may have seen, there were changes with the stimulus package uh, that were voted on last night, so we will touch on that a little bit, but we have not had the opportunity to fully go through the uh, bill that was passed in the Senate. So to the extent that you have any questions for that, you will have all of our contact information and can certainly reach out after the event. I also want to um, provide a little bit of background on the presenters that you'll hear from today. Um, as Jonathan said, my name is Deb Giroux and I'm a shareholder in the healthcare and litigation departments of Butzel Long. With us also is Mark Lazat, a shareholder and also a healthcare and nonprofit attorney. Brett Miller, shareholder in our firm, who is in the labor and employment arena, as well as John Hancock, also a shareholder in the labor and employment Lynn McGuire, who is a shareholder in our Ann Arbor office, is a employee benefits attorney. And rounding out the panel today is Jonathan Kirkland, an associate in our Bloomfield Hills office who focuses on corporate law. Today we have a hour and a half to present to you um, information that we believe is going to be uh, fundamental to all of your practices. A lot of this information came from the board of MASA, so we again would like to thank them for allowing us to provide this presentation to its membership as well as the healthcare community at large, so welcome to them. Um, our goals today is to give an overview of the executive orders and recent changes in the laws and regulations that help uh, that affect the healthcare providers, employers, so that you are up to date on what you can and cannot do and to answer those tough questions as to who to uh, retain, who not to retain, and things like that. We also want to give you an understanding of the laws, um, but also know that they're changing on a daily basis. So what we say today may be different tomorrow. Um, we also want you to recognize that our advice is based on Michigan law as well as the federal law. So to the extent that we have any attendees that have um, locations in other states, we have not gone into any detail there. Um, and, and remember, we're lawyers. We are not medical professionals. So we cannot get into and wouldn't even attempt to get into any discussions with respect to any of the symptomology of COVID-19 or any other health condition. And finally, we are just one piece of the puzzle. We've been putting together since this pandemic started a number of alerts and webinars for our clients and for the general public and have collected them in a resource center that is on our butzel.com webpage. We've given you um, a little snapshot of where you can find it when you first land on the Butzel Long page. So please visit that often 
um, as the content is updated on a daily basis. With that, wanted to give you a little roadmap of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to start with a high view of the different um, executive orders that have come out of the Michigan Governor's Office with respect to uh, healthcare entities. Some of them are across the board general businesses, while others stay um, are specific to healthcare operations. We're also going to touch very briefly, because that would be a webinar in and of itself on the various telehealth options for continued services. And then we'll get into uh, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act that was passed earlier this, well, this past week um, and get into all of the differences between the laws that were changed under that package, what you can expect, what you can do, the obligations as employers, and then lead into the uh, financial aspects of the situation, including the small business loans and other funding support, as well as um, touching very briefly on the stimulus package that has been passed by the Senate late last night. So there are 21, actually, I guess there's 22 executive orders at this time. Um, the ones that I've put on your screen right now are the ones that probably have the most um, impact on the healthcare community. The first of which is the actual declaration of the state of emergency that was um, issued on March 10th. That set everything into motion in terms of what the governor and what the government of Michigan was able to do on an expedited emergency basis. So I've identified a number of them. Um, Executive Order 2020-7 placed the temporary restrictions on entry into healthcare facilities. And that was one that is worked in conjunction with a couple of other ones. Um, as it pertains to the ability of family members and non-essential personnel um, working or even visiting to healthcare facilities, your ASCs, your residential care facilities, your skilled nursing homes, and, and things like that. Um, also uh, significant is the expansion of unemployment eligibility and cost sharing. Um, and Brett will get into that a little bit more later on, but that talks about the ability of the healthcare employers uh, to lay off temporarily their workforce that need not be on premise during this pandemic and who cannot perform their functions tele uh, through remote communications. You also have um, the executive order 13, which had temporary enhancements on operational capacity and efficiency in healthcare facilities. And that did a number of different um, things, including the ability to allow certain students to provide um, healthcare and healthcare related services and expanded services allowed by non-nursing personnel that would typically be provided by your nursing staff. They've also expanded through an executive order child care access, which is significant to those that have workforce members that are critical to the healthcare operations, but for, per, for reasons of the school closures didn't have child care access. And significantly that allows for uh, child care on premises without a license um, provided by the employer. Um, the last two are probably the most significant to this discussion. The first of which is uh, number 17, which talks about temporary restrictions on non-essential medical and dental procedures. Um, essentially, looking to what is the factual situation of what the patient needs and allowing emergency procedures, trauma procedures, and asking practitioners to withhold any elective or preventative procedures until further notice. And then last but not least, the one that has impacted everyone is the uh, 
Executive Order 21, which is the stay home, stay safe order that we are all working under at this time. So EO 2020-21, the stay home, stay safe order. Um, a little bit of background on that. The governor has said that it is to be construed broadly to prohibit in-person work. My apologies. Um, that's not necessary to sustain or protect life. And so that's kind of the critical decision making that needs to be done. If it's not necessary to sustain or protect life, then you should at all means um, cease providing those services. However, that has been very broadly construed on the healthcare front to mean everything from activities of daily life that are needed for the elderly and those that are homebound, um, the trauma and emergency procedures that are needed, the obvious ones are those that are um, showing symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19. Um, and then to the extent that individuals are in fact required to be at work, you still have to adopt the social distancing practices that have been spelled out by the CDC. And we see everywhere the hand washing, the distancing six feet or more protective personal protective equipment and the like. <clears throat> um, the critical infrastructure worker designation letter is something that has been discussed amongst the healthcare um, community and people are taking different um, tactics with that. The exception in EO 2020-21 um, provides that healthcare and public health workers need not have this designation. They're automatically designated. However, I have been um, telling my clients and those that have asked that you should probably have that designation letter to be safe because we don't know if you're going to have a rogue um, police officer stopping individuals that are on the road just to find out whether or not they should or should not be traveling at this time in light of the stay home order, having that designation letter that says that they work for this healthcare entity or they work for this ambulatory surgery center or they work for this healthcare provider allows them to avoid any confrontation with the officers and let them go on their way. There's no magic language that needs to be in that designation letter, simply that they are a critical infrastructure worker for your facility, and therefore they will be traveling to and from the location that they are typically working from. So who are the critical infrastructure um, workers and what industries or sectors are there? This is a little snapshot from CESA that identifies the different sectors that are considered critical infrastructure during the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, healthcare and public health is among the more than 14 entities or sectors. Um, I have a list right here of all of them. And obviously we wanna focus on the, the critical, critical infrastructure sectors of healthcare and public health, because that's who we're talking about today. As it pertains to the healthcare critical infrastructure workers, these are the COVID-19 workers. These are the ones that are doing the testing, the frontline individuals that are doing the research on ways to treat and prevent COVID-19. Um, these are your nurses, these are your doctors, these are your MAs that are dealing directly with the patients that are presenting to your facilities. They're also the hospital and lab personnel. And that can be a very broad statement. It can be a very broad um, sweep of your employees. However, you have to look back at the necessary to sustain life and protect the health to determine whether or not someone's position is in fact one that is critical to your operations. 
um, workers in other medical facilities should be treated the same as hospital and lab personnel. If they have to be there and if they cannot do their job offsite or remotely, then you would deem them critical infrastructure workers. You also have the manufacturers, logistics, warehouse operators, and things like that that are going to keep your supply chain and your equipment working properly, as well as keeping you in a, a position of having the supplies necessary and the medications necessary. So they would also be considered part of the critical infrastructure for healthcare sector. Your public health workers, just like your hospital personnel and your private workers, are equally um, critical to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So they would be in the critical infrastructure worker segment. Workers that cannot practically work remotely fall under this um, same definition. Um, and I've had questions with respect to billing, health information, things like that. And to the extent that your billing personnel, every everyone's going to be made up differently. If your billing personnel or other personnel that are on the back side of your operations can do their job remotely, I would suggest strongly that you have them do so rather than being in the mix of your organization. If they can't, and if you deem the billing and um, cybersecurity and IT perspective to be something that is critical to your operations, um, then they can be deemed one of the critical infrastructure workers. I would just give the caveat that if they don't need to be there on a daily basis, maybe you cut down their hours. Um, but you, every entity is going to have a different perspective of this. So you need to make sure that whatever you are doing, you're deeming those individuals critical infrastructure workers based on the necess necessity of your organization and continued operations. This is just a list of what you can and cannot do under the um, stay home, stay safe order. Um, the, the biggest thing is leaving home to work without the designation as a critical infrastructure worker. In the healthcare arena, like I said, you don't need that letter, but I think the individual needs to know whether or not they are part of the critical infrastructure for your organization. And if they don't have that, it's a safer bet that they stay home um, as opposed to taking chances of spreading the COVID-19 to the public or bringing it home to them, to their loved ones. Um, a lot of these we know because we've been working under the stay home, stay safe order um, even before it was issued. So going to the grocery store, you know, picking take up, things like that to sustain your own life are, are permissible. The weather's great today. It's a great day to go out, walk your pets, take your children out, just get that fresh air. Those are the things that you can do. You're not confined to your home. So the question is under 2017, um, the non-essential procedures. I'm in here. Yeah. Versus the stay home, stay safe order. And under 2017, we're talking about procedure based um, considerations. This will apply to your hospitals, the ASCs, your dental practices things that are preventative um, or elective surgeries should be canceled at the moment. Where we're looking at non-essential procedure postponement plans, um, 2017 has you develop those so that you know what you can and cannot do, and so you can step accordingly. But even with the 20 21 uh, stay home, stay safe order. There's exceptions for healthcare workers that we discussed, and that is to 
have that consideration of what is necessary to sustain life and health. Um, you should also have on these two orders a patient communication plan so that your patients know that at the time uh, and preventative services will be rescheduled in the future. Also, comparing the two um, executive orders, as I said previously, emergency and trauma treatment is absolutely permissible. Um, procedures that are necessary to preserve the patient's health and safety, safety as determined by the licensed provider. So you don't have anyone that's going to be looking over your shoulder and saying that is or is not an emergency. That's a medical decision and one that the provider should make if they're willing to do that. Um, this would probably entail a at least telephonic discussion with the individual to see what their signs and symptomology is, to see if something would be an emergency or trauma situation whereby you can treat it, or if there's other means to assess the situation and try to um, alleviate some of the concerns that the patient has. There are also exceptions for pregnancy and labor and delivery, as well as advanced cardio disease, organ transplant, dialysis, and similar procedures. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that you have an obstetrics practice and it is the um, periodic checkup by the pregnant patient, um, they are suggesting that if you can do it telephonically or through telehealth, telemedicine to do so, um, you can get all of the information from the patient with respect to their, their progress at that time. Obviously, labor and delivery is not going to be postponed because you really can't postpone that in most situations. So that would fall under the emergency or uh, necessary services for either one of these executive orders. Um, the, the question that they have you ask yourself is, would postponement of the procedure significantly impact the health, safety, and welfare of the patient? If you're going to answer yes to that, then you are entitled and probably should be providing the services that are necessary. And right now I'm going to turn it over to Mark Lazat to talk about some of the some of the scenarios that we've seen or that we would typically seen and whether or not they are fall under the stay home, stay safe or non-essential procedures orders. Mark? Thanks, Deb. You know, as Deb mentioned, the issue here is that you've got these two executive orders and how they play together, the one on non-essential procedures and the one on uh, stay home, stay safe. The later one, the broad one, has very broad exceptions for healthcare workers. So if you only read that, you would think that all healthcare workers can do anything. But what we want to emphasize is because of 2020-17 and non-essential procedures, that's not quite true. You still have to pay attention to particular circumstances and scenarios. And that's why you get into the things that Deb talked about a minute ago, about answering questions about whether health and safety are going to be affected and making some decisions about postponing versus continuing certain procedures. Um, one of the things that Deb mentioned a minute ago was that um, the 2020-17 uh, required that you have a um, non-essential procedures plan. Um, it's worth um, emphasizing that for a second because I think that that's probably not necessarily something that you need to develop from scratch because most organizations probably have some sort of plan or should have some sort of plan for other sorts of disasters. What if there were a fire or a tornado that destroyed your facility? What would you do about rescheduling urgent cases and postponing non-urgent cases? 
one would hope that most organizations already have a plan like that. You are required to have a non-essential procedures plan. I'm going to suggest that you should go back to whatever your disaster recovery plans are, see if you can update them and use them for this purpose, but you should be able to um, use that sort of thinking to come up with a distinction between what's essential and what's not essential, what has to be performed, what has to be referred elsewhere, and what can simply be performed and pushed down the road. So with that framework in mind, let's think about some specific scenarios. Um, the 2020-17 uh, specifically mentioned freestanding outpatient surgery centers and dental offices. And so your distinction there is gonna have to be, is it emergency versus routine or elective procedures? Is their uh, routine or elective procedures should be postponed or rescheduled. An emergency obviously can affect health and safety. In some circumstances, if you're doing um, you know, knee replacement surgery because it's right after a trauma and someone has to regain capacity and is in terrible pain, that might be appropriate. If it's a knee replacement surgery because someone's been thinking about it for two years and they just happen to get around to scheduling it uh, this week, then that's probably something that can be uh, treated as elective. So you have to make judgments as to um, the emergent nature versus the routine nature of the procedure. One thing that you might think about in all of these scenarios is if you do nothing, would the situation get worse? You're always going to want to think about um, if, if the patient would spiral out of control and end up having to be admitted to a hospital or another facility, then it's better to do the procedure now. You want to not use hospital capacity by waiting too long and making someone's situation worse. And um, so the what would happen if I didn't do it question comes into play. Um, eye care is not specifically mentioned in the order, but you should have the sort of same thinking, emergency versus elective procedure. Um, there's a little bit of a second order effect here. Does the optician in the, uh, um, who, you know, sells glasses, is that a critical procedure or something that can be postponed? Probably can be postponed, but then again, what if a nurse or a first responder calls and says, I broke my glasses and I need them fixed before I go back to work? So in some of these circumstances, even if the individual performing the service isn't a critical worker, they may be performing the service for someone else who is a critical worker, and therefore that sort of second order effect is you would want to make yourself available, stay open for helping people who need that sort of thing. Um, for primary care uh, practices, we'll talk a little bit later about some telehealth information. That's where it comes in. Phone consultations, clearly availability of prescription uh, renewals, uh, that sort of thing. There was actually another alert that came out, I think just last night, about emergency prescription renewals and the authorization of pharmacists to do it. We haven't even had a chance to digest that yet, but we'll follow up with more on that. But so for primary care, there's going to be a lot of postponement, a lot of phone consultations, and a lot of um, prescription renewals. If, if um, somebody needs their blood pressure medication, it's the same one they've been on for five years, and there aren't any real changes, then there's no reason why you can't just prescribe another 90 days worth of it and not see the person. So um, you have to think practically about maintaining care. Mental behavioral health issues, I'm going to suggest, are probably way more likely to be health and safety concerns, drug and alcohol rehab, because that's probably going to fall in the category of things that if we don't keep those appointments, things will get worse and people will end up needing more care. And that's simply something we want to avoid. Um, so next we go forward to a couple of other ideas on the next slide about, um, uh, whoops, we skipped over one, elder care or home and community-based services. A lot of services that may be provided in the home for a senior or for someone with a disability are important to preserve safety and health and also maybe preserve independence. Someone who's living semi-independently needs some assistance with activities of daily living. Um, you might have to look at a little bit of a distinction between are you performing medical services versus companion services. But I think generally speaking, you're going to want to be focused on preserving the safety and avoid somebody again uh, having their condition worsen and spiraling out of control, which would require them to be admitted to a hospital or transferred to a skilled nursing facility or some other institutional care. You want to avoid that if all possible. It's not really safe for people to be going in into an institutional care setting if they're 
seniors or if possibly immunocompromised. But again, how can you provide these services? But I want to suggest that you probably want to balance the needed services versus some infection risk of having people to come into the home. Um, perhaps there are some things that you're doing that can be modified. Um, if we skip ahead to the next slide, this comes in this context of um, home care services as well. Um, again, are you preserving safety and independence? Are you worsening? Are you avoiding worsening conditions that would require somebody to be placed in a different setting that would um, that would not be advised and would use resources inappropriately? But is it time to get out the patient's care plan? There may be some things you can do that modified a little bit. I'm gonna suggest that, that for elder care or home-based uh, care, or home health, PTOT, home and community-based services to someone with a disability, I'm gonna suggest that these are not all or nothing cases. You can determine what's reasonably needed for health, safety, and activities of daily living and adjust accordingly. If there's even one fewer person who goes into the home, then that's one fewer opportunity to expose someone to an infection risk. So this may be a time for home-based services to very thoughtfully go back through the patient's plan of care and say, is there something we can do? It doesn't have to be all or nothing. What do we need to do? What realistically can we modify and make things a little safer um, for everybody? Uh, there is, by the way, in 2021, uh, the, the uh, broader order, there's a specific exception for veterinarians. So um, you are allowed to take your, your pets to the vet. So not only can you take them out for a walk, like uh, Deb, Deb mentioned, but um, you can head off to the vet with them and, um, and get your pets taken care of. So um, um, we wanted to give that some sort of practical scenarios for different types of care settings, always keeping in mind that health and safety and avoiding worsening conditions situation in mind. So with that as a, a, a you know as some background, we want to go back to one very specific thing because there's some a lot of um, orders and waivers and additional rules on flexibility for telehealth. So I'm going to throw this back to Deb and she's going to talk specifically about some of the telehealth options that are in not only the state rules but some new federal rules. Thanks, Mark. And I want to touch on real quickly um, one of the newest uh, executive orders that Mark mentioned. And again, we haven't had time to digest it, but it is Executive Order 2020 25. And in a nutshell, it allows, gov or it allows pharmacies to dispense emergency medications through prescriptions um for up to 60 days and that takes effect immediately and runs through april 22nd um as he indicated we will probably have an alert posted on our website in the next day um giving more detail about that particular executive order but now i want to turn to telemedicine and telehealth and as you probably have been seeing there's been a lot of movement, especially on the federal government part, to allow um, and actually encourage telemedicine and telehealth services as opposed to inpatient services or in your typical face-to-face -face services. The screen right here that I have up is particularly um, beneficial because it gives you the three different types of telehealth visits or services that Medicare has recognized now as being appropriate. Um, some of them have been in place for a while. Some of them have been opened up a bit based on the COVID-19. But for all intents and purposes, this is a great chart for you to have at your facilities, especially if you're an ASC, but you have patients that you can also see from a primary care because a lot of the um, facilities have those services. So um, I, I don't want to get into a lot of detail because the the bulk of this webinar wants to focus on the labor and employment issues that healthcare practitioners are, are facing today. Um, but I just want to give a, a, a brief overview that from Medicare, you have three different types of visits and they have different 
um, requirements for payment. Um, this chart is perfect. It's something that CMS has put together for its practitioners. So you can see that there's Medicare telehealth visits where that is the visit between the provider and their patient. This is, you know, it gives you the common um, HCPCS or CPT codes that you can do. What's nice is that it's now opened up. It used to be that it had to be an established patient, but now with the waiver for the COVID-19 pandemic, it applies to new patients as well. Um, so I've given you the information to get the complete list of the uh, CPT codes that are um, available under the Medicare telehealth visits concept. You also have the virtual check-in, which this is something that they are really pushing um, on all levels. And that is just a brief telephonic call with your between the practitioner and the patient to really determine what is necessary, what their symptoms are. Is it something that you can simply tell them you need to do A, B, C, and D, but stay home? Um, or go to the emergency room or something like that and get into a more detailed telehealth visit or even the third category, which is the e-visit. But again, the, the last two, the virtual check-in and the e-visits, those are for established patients only. So, um, you know, the Medicare telehealth visits is the one that you want to focus on now because it's the newest, but in all situations uh, to the extent that you can and are still um, communicating with your patients with respect to their um, medical condition, then looking at that and if you're following the Medicare or even the commercial payer guidelines, that may be compensable. So all is not lost even though you may not physically be in your facility. If I could just jump in there for um, your patients that are not on Medicare, the federal law has um, been eased up for telehealth as well. For people who have a high deductible health plan, you can provide telehealth services regardless of whether they're preventative care or not uh, associated with COVID-19 without causing that patient to lose their eligibility for their health savings account. And in the bill that was passed through the Senate yesterday morning, they expanded that to say um, any type of telehealth services you provide to an individual in a high deductible health plan will be okay. Thank you, Lynn. Um, the other, we'll say government entity that has come out um, and loosened the reins, if you will, is the Office of Civil Rights. And this is your HIPAA police, if you will. And earlier this month, they issued a notification saying that they were not going to enforce HIPAA telehealth requirements for good faith provision of telehealth services. And that's really going to the security and privacy aspect of your traditional telehealth services. Um, the OCR is not going to enforce any violations so long as your communications and your telehealth services are rendered in a good faith manner. Um, there are some caveats to that. And the caveats are that you have to be utilizing a non-public facing platform. So they have gone, OCR has specifically identified a number of those non-public facing platforms, which I've listed here, and they include FaceTime, if you're an iPhone user, Facebook Messenger, Video Chat, Google Hangouts, Skype, um, as well as common texting applications that are also non-public facing, such as Jabber, iMessage, uh, Facebook Messenger and the like. They have also specifically called out public facing platforms that are prohibited, which include TikTok, Facebook Live, Twitch and the like. So if you're going to be utilizing telehealth with your patients, you don't have to have the concern that OCR is going to have take any enforcement action against you unless of course you are utilizing these public facing platforms. And then I guess you could say all bets are off. The OIG for the federal government, the Office of Inspector General has also issued a directive um, to providers and is waiving the um, penalty provisions for providers who 
waive cost sharing responsibilities of Medicare beneficiaries for telehealth services. So traditionally the OIG frowns upon and takes action against uh, providers who routinely waive copays and deductibles of their patients that are, are Medicare and, and federal beneficiaries. However, given the COVID-19 um, pandemic, they are saying that telehealth services um, as well as routine waivers of copay will not be subject to administrative sanctions. Um, and in March 20, on March 24th, so two days ago, they issued a guidance that says it applies to a broad range of non-face-to-face -face services um, and not only Medicare telehealth codes. Um, and it also applies to hospital reimbur reimbursements under assignment. So if your practitioner is uh, providing the services, the hospital can waive the copay um, under these new directives and notifications. In Michigan, Medicaid also expanded access to telemedicine um, by order on March 12th of this year. Um, allowing virtual care services to beneficiaries in their homes while also waiving co-pays for COVID-19. And as Lynn and I both mentioned, commercial insurers are also waiving cost sharing for COVID-19 testing, such as Blue Cross Blue Shield, HAP and Priority, um, as well as for telehealth services. Telehealth services. I'm going to turn it over to Mark to discuss the donation of critical supplies. Mark? Yeah, just a brief mention here because there are uh, calls from the governor's office and of course other people have been doing this voluntarily about donating uh, medical supplies and equipment to hospitals and to other providers. So just a brief mention. Um, because there's a little bit of tracking that you have to pay attention to here uh, for a, a recipient of donations who is a nonprofit, if, if anyone on the call is in that situation, you're still going to want to keep records of this. Because you're supposed to report and acknowledge donations. So, um, even if somebody gives you some mechanism to uh, track and report on those from the um oops we go back to the uh, um from the point of view of the um from the point of view of the donors uh, you know potentially tax deductibility if you care about that you can keep track of it um but uh, but again just at a very high level you're going to want to pay a little It looks like we may have lost Mark there. Our apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, Deb, do you want to move on to Brett's section? Yes, thanks, Jonathan. Um, Brett Miller, uh, our shareholder in labor and employment, and um, with the assistance of Lynn McGuire and John Hancock, are now going to talk to you about the various labor and employment issues that we've seen uh, rising because of COVID-19 and the various changes in the laws and regulations that have resulted. So, Brett, if you want to take the reins. Sure, thank you very much. <clears throat> we want to talk about some of these new laws that have been passed, Deb, and um, there's, you had a lot of discussion about the sort of stimulus bill that that is kind of just brand new. Um, I'll be focusing on a law that was passed about a week ago, so not to be confused with this new stimulus measure, but a law that passed March uh, 19th, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, one of the first things I want to mention is that this is a law that's going into effect April 1st, and it's going to affect employers from one who have one employee to 500 employees. So this affects even small, you know, healthcare offices uh, and, and is something that everyone needs to pay attention to. There's a lot of uh, information out there that this law goes into effect later. It, the Department of Labor issued some clarification this week. The effective date is April 1st. So within, within this Families First Coronavirus Response Act, I'll be focusing on two 
two portions of this overall law that really impact healthcare employers, and that's the Family Medical Leave Expansion Act and the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. These are two laws that in some ways are going to work a little together, uh, but are going to have a, a sort of drastic impact on employers in the short term. So we're talking about these laws. Generally speaking, these are new leave entitlement laws designed to respond to the COVID-19 crisis and, and address employment issues. So there's there's the two of them again. One, as I noted, is the Family Medical Leave Act expansion, and the other is the emergency paid sick leave. The if FMLA expansion is going to apply to employers who have fewer than 500 employees, also public agencies, small businesses uh, under 50 employees will be covered for the first time with family medical leave for this expansion. And we're getting a lot of questions and there's a lot of confusion in this area because for those of you familiar with the traditional Family Medical Leave Act, it applies to businesses that have 50 or more employees located within a 75 mile radius. Um, so, you know, different medical clinics that, that in a 75 mile radius end up adding up to 50 employees are covered by the traditional Family Medical Leave Act, but this expansion is broader. So the 5075 is still true for your traditional FMLA where people take leave for sickness or to care for someone. The expanded Family Medical Leave relating to COVID-19 school closures, which we'll talk about more, uh, applies to everybody even if you have under 50 employees, so one to 500. Uh, there's a lot of confusion about that. And the Department of Labor has not done much to help, frankly, because they have uh, they have put out guidance that says if you are a small business, if you are a small health practice with under 50 employees, you may be exempt. Uh, but they haven't issued rules yet to say um, exactly how you're exempt or what you need to do to prove that. Uh, the theory being, if 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 having people take leave, if you're a smaller shop, and if it it, you know, affects the, jeopardizes the viability of your business or, or your ability to care for patients, you might be exempt. Uh, but right now we, we don't really know. There are special rules for healthcare providers, okay, and, and emergency responders under the FMLA. But again, we have very little guidance on what that actually means. So far, the definition of healthcare provider is the same one that we have seen for the traditional Family Medical Leave Act for 20, 30 years, uh, which is physicians, attendings, nurse practitioners, uh, clinical psychologists, clinical social workers. It does not currently address some of your uh, frontline caregivers, you know, and nurse aides. There's no carve out for, you know, respiratory. Uh, you, know, you know, some of these, some of these positions that really are going to be affected by this crisis and employers need all hands on deck. I anticipate we'll see regulations that are going to broaden the exemptions under these leave laws for healthcare workers, but right now uh, the regulations aren't out. They're due out in April, but we we really don't know. Uh, but that that's that's what the expanded Family Medical Leave Act covers. There's also a provision, as you can see in the slide, for emergency paid sick leave. Okay, again, this rule applies to the the people who have uh, companies that have one to 500 employees. Um, there again may be an opt-out provision as we get regulations from the DOL for the smaller employers, but right now it's still it's still kind of vague. And, the, and we'll talk in more detail about what this sick leave law will do. But just for broad purposes, if if you're a business that has under 500 employees, um, you're going to be looking at, at at this kind of at this coverage. The, so one of the questions we've seen is exactly how do we count the employees to figure out if we're at this, you know, some some businesses may be over the 500 and completely exempt from this law. Well, the DOL, Department of Labor, issued guidance on this a few days ago. Uh, we've put the websites up on the screen and it's also available by going to departmentoflabor.gov. Uh, but basically, without getting into too much legalese, if you... Um, if you don't have 500 employees now, or if you have multiple separate businesses, maybe different, you know, different healthcare um, 
companies uh, that are, are you consider truly separate em employers right now, you can't suddenly decide to aggregate them and try to count up to get over 500. That's sort of the main takeaway. Um, but the the integrated employer tests that the government is telling us to use for expanded family medical leave and the so-called joint employer tests that they, they are talking about for emergency paid sick leave is extremely fact specific. It, there's a lot of factors that go into it. If you have any questions, if you think this law may may not apply to you, um, call your attorney, call us. We can walk you through it. It's it's just too specific to kind of advise, you know, in in a PowerPoint slide. Uh, but we do have at least a little guidance now from the government that we can we can advise clients on what this law is going to cover. But just because your business or your healthcare practice is covered and, and, and the law applies doesn't mean that all of your employees will also be covered. So there's again, specific rules for this. The family medical leave expansion requires the employees to have been on your payroll for 30 days. Um, that's, that's the direct guidance. As of March 2nd, if you had an employee who started on that payroll uh, as a new hire, Come April 1st, when this law goes into effect, and the law is not retroactive, it, it starts April 1st, and that's when the leave entitlement begins, uh, those employees who have been on that payroll for the 30 days would be eligible. Again, this is, this is very different than the Family Medical Leave Act traditional law, where you, there was a, you, you had to have someone working for 12 months to even be eligible. For That rule is still true for traditional family medical leave, but for this expansion piece, New hires, 30 days are also included. Uh, but there, there is a more narrow definition than what we're used to with a traditional Family Medical Leave Act. The employee has to be unable to work or telework, and the expanded FMLA only applies for an employee who is unable to work and telework and caring for a minor son or daughter because the child's school or place of care has been closed or unavailable due to the crisis. In Michigan, of course, we know that schools have been closed since mid-March. So that particular provision is gonna apply really to anybody with a minor child, uh, school-aged child, elementary school, middle school, high school, um, daycare. You know, So there's a, a large chunk of an employer population who have minor children that this law is automatically gonna apply to uh, unless you're under 50 employees and you can get an exemption or we get broader health care exemptions. Uh, again, we simply don't know. The Emergency Sick Leave Act um, does not even have a minimum period of, of, of working. So new hires as of day one could suddenly be um, you know, entitled to into the into potential leave. But again, there's some specific criteria of um, who is covered by the new emergency paid sick leave. Generally speaking, what the law does, if you have employees who are covered, they get 80 hours of um, paid leave. And we'll talk in a minute about how both the expanded FMLA, which has a paid portion, and this emergency paid sick leave is supposed to be completely reimbursed, free for employers. Government um, is going to pick up the bill. Um, but there, there's a lot of administrative process that employers and healthcare providers are going to have to consider. So for your employees to be eligible for the emergency paid sick leave, again, for one to 500 employer uh, employee companies, they have to either be subject to a quarantine or isolation order from the government, uh, under quarantine from a healthcare provider. They have to be uh, number three um, on, on the slide, have uh, symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a diagnosis, or then there's several provisions for caring for another in the four or five uh, on the slide. Number three is probably the most problematic because any one of your employees could simply say that they are, you know, having a dry cough or have a fever and they don't want to come to work. And all they have to do is say they're seeking a diagnosis. And oh, by the way, I can't get into my primary care physician for three weeks uh, to get a diagnosis. So I'm not coming into work. Uh, I think that one is going to be a very big problem. Uh, and we'll talk more in a minute about 
sort of the impact of these these laws and in, in on your workforce but but in terms of just kind of eligibility number three will be a problem we get a lot of questions about number one employees subject to a quarantine or isolation order from the government uh, if you are a critical work if you, a critical infrastructure essential healthcare provider uh, that doesn't apply because your employees are not subject to a government uh, quarantine they are able to work um, if your business or if your healthcare practice dental practice maybe your elective surgery and you are unable to or you are subject to the executive order uh, that provision number one uh, could entitle your workforce to leave under this act so we'll go into a few more details about what that actually means so for the family medical leave act expansion portion of that okay as i mentioned this is a potentially or this is a paid leave act the traditional family medical leave that everyone is used to and has been out since the early 90s has been an unpaid leave now for the first time for the expansion we see requirement for paid leave <clears throat> the first 10 days would be unpaid but the employee can choose to use any available PTO, vacation, sick leave that they have available to make those first 10 days paid. If they qualify for the uh, expanded emergency paid leave act, those first 10 days could also be paid. Uh, you cannot require them to use PTO though. In other words, this is really purely an employee choice on how they want to have those first 10 days covered, either paid through their existing PTO or unpaid, and it's their choice, not yours. <clears throat> the paid leave act, um, or paid leave portions then for the expanded FMLA kick in after those first 10 days. And what happens is the employee would get 10 weeks of paid leave, at least two thirds of their regular rate of pay, but there's caps. It's capped at $200 per day, 10,000 in the aggregate for the duration. We get a lot of questions about how this actually works. I've mentioned the traditional Family Medical Leave Act, which provides 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Uh, and now we have this expanded leave. And, and everyone's wondering, well, does that mean that if I have an employee who's on FMLA now, the traditional FMLA and has been, do they get another 12 weeks or another 10 weeks under this expansion? The government hasn't said anything about that. There's no regulations, no guidance. My best guess for everyone is no. Um, the, the bill did not change the traditional definition of a total entitlement of 12 weeks leave. So I doubt that we're gonna see the government say, okay, well, you may have taken 12 weeks, but now you get another 12. We don't know, but uh, I doubt it. <coughs> so the expanded FMLA um, does have some other provisions on how we calculate who who's a, a full-time employee and how this pay would work. Okay, so if you you have to look at the average number of hours um, that someone had scheduled, if they are part-time or PRN, <clears throat> you're supposed to kind of take a six-month look back and average it out. If you can't do that, um, it's the reasonable expectation of what you think the employee would be working you know prn staff all right you know we probably need them usually 15 hours whatever that number is would be the leave entitlement okay so it does get complicated if you don't have full-time employees that you're trying to figure out uh, but the, the guidance does talk about how you calculate an average and a look back for these these leave entitlements and they give and then we have examples okay so let's say an hourly medical assistant you know, someone that is, is not salaried, you're literally paying them by the hour. <clears throat> they have a 12 year old at home, uh, school's closed. The employee is allowed to work under a, or a shelter in place order because deemed essential for a healthcare function or a healthcare practice, okay? $18 an hour, full-time, eight hours a day, 40 hour a week. Um, can't telework because of, of the, um, you know, the job requirements. So in terms of the FMLA expansion, how would this actually work once the law goes into effect April 1st? Okay, the first 10 days, if this employee needs this leave because of the school closure, that first 10 days through April 11th would either be unpaid or the employee could choose PTO. 
<coughs> starting on April 12th, the employee would get that pay at $96 a workday. Okay, if the school is closed to the end of the year or is continued. You can see the calculations for the 10 weeks at that point uh, total out to $4,800. We'll talk about the government tax credits in a moment, but that's just an example of how this would work for, for one employee. <coughs> for a salaried employee, another example, okay? Again, school closure, um, but this is a higher earning occupational therapist, 80,000 a year salary which you can break down into an hourly 40 hour week, $38.46, okay? Again, this is someone that's essential, critical healthcare worker allowed to work under the shelter in place order. Right now we don't have any guidance from the government <coughs> on whether uh, this person would be exempt from this law, um, you know, but we may have PTs, OTs exempted, just we don't have regulations. But for now, we're gonna assume FMLA expansion applies to the salaried occupational therapist who can't do work from home, isn't subject to the executive order, a same kind of situation. 10-day waiting period beginning April 1st, cho can choose to use PTO or not. On April 2nd, or uh, pardon me, April 12th, after that 10-day period, the regardless of PTO, the employer has to pay the, the cap, $200 that workday. Uh, and then over 10 weeks, the, hit the cap of 10,000 due to the the higher earning of this person. So that's how, again, an example there with, with someone who's higher compensated and salaried and how this would work. <clears throat> so some other obligations to be aware of. Um, for those who take leave under this law, they are entitled to job restoration <clears throat> unless there's... Um, some very limited exceptions. If you're a practice with 25 or fewer employees, there may be some exceptions on restoring someone's job. You know, with companies that's or you know businesses and healthcare practices that small, sometimes you need an immediate replacement to even function if someone is out on an extended leave. Um, but the the government has has sort of put in some potential rules. That they, you know, they they may not be able to be reinstated for those smaller practices, uh, but there's even recall rights under the law that if you do need to bring somebody, you know, hire somebody back, they have a basically 12 month recall period where you would be obligated to bring that person back. So a lot of com probably unnecessary complexity to this that um, that could cause some some problems down the line but just something to be aware of right now. And again, there are potential opt-outs for those with 50 or fewer employees, uh, but until the government issues regulations in April, we don't really know. Another factor for those who have, you know, if these employees have healthcare benefits, they have to be continued during this leave period. So, you know, that's something that uh, can add, uh, you know, additional administrative burden and, and costs, but is, uh, something to be aware of for those who are not used to having to administer family medical leave. So that's the expanded family medical leave portion, which again can go up to 12 weeks. The obligations under the new emergency paid sick leave act, which is this separate law, is a shorter period. Uh, it, it only relates to 80 hours of paid sick leave. So again, this is something that goes in and you would have to be paid immediately. There's no 10 day waiting period like in the in the expanded family medical portion. I mean, if, if this if the employee qualifies, it's like PTO, it's like a sick day, it's immediately paid. Uh, the criteria though, of course, are, you know, the they have to actually be unable to work and need this leave. And we'll break down the reasons for this as we, we outlined at the beginning. Um, subject to the, the state or local quarantine, like the shelter in place order. As I mentioned, if you're exempt, if you're a healthcare provider that is not subject to this, you don't need to worry about number one because your employees are able to work. For number two, you know, we're getting into some more, more granular detail of, of someone with a kind of, you know, a doctor's note or <clears throat> claiming that they can't work because they've been advised to shelter or quarantine for 14 days. 
uh, and again, so after April 1st, you you would you would be obligated to give them paid leave if they have that sort of um, diagnosis or if they've been it's so advised by a healthcare provider. Number three again is the is the really broad broad um, <laughs> exemption because if they if they claim to be experiencing symptoms and this is one of the biggest practical problems we've been seeing in the last few weeks. Um, and uh, uh, even, you know, before this law goes into effect, um, just practically speaking, we have healthcare clients who are calling saying people are afraid, they don't want to come to work, uh, they want to stay home. Um, and when you try to get them to come to work, the pushback is, you know what, I'm just not feeling well today. I think I have a fever. And then, what do you do? Okay, well now we don't want you to come to work. Um, so there's, you know, there's a really easy way right now to kind of just get off work. A lot of employers right right now are making it unpaid, but as of April first, there would be an expectation to um, to have this. Or, you know, th this would fall under an actual federal leave entitlement law. You'd have to give them the pay. So this one's going to be a huge problem. We're hoping for guidance from the government on, you know, the, the healthcare exemption so that we can designate and, and have some of the critical healthcare providers not fall under this rule. Uh, so we don't have, you know, huge swaths of our healthcare workforce just not showing up to work. There are other provisions under this that, that people can take leave for, and the pay is a little different, we'll talk about, but the there's there's uh, care for other provisions, you know, you have to care for someone who's been subject to a um, isolation order. Um, it's supposed to be a bona fide need for this. Same thing if you're caring for a child because of the child school closure, very similar to the expanded FMLA. Okay, but these are these are uh, provisions that relate to care for someone else as opposed to the self care that we talked about in the last slide. Again, the duration to leave, the maximum leave entitlement is going to be 80 hours of paid sick time. For part-time employees, um, you know, the 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 leave entitlement is going to be their average hours on over a two-week period of what they would work over a two-week period. Okay. Um, and can your PRN staff contingent variable, again, we're going to look do a look back period and figure out what kind of leave they're entitled to. But the Department of Labor has issued guidance on how this <clears throat> full-time hour would work which of course again is unnecessarily complicated but they give an example of an employee who worked average has a shift <clears throat> of 50 hours one week and 30 the next and the government says okay well then their leave entitlement is 50 hours calculated at the regular rate of pay for that week and then the next week their leave entitlement is 30 that gets them to the 80 but you can't make them just do a 40-40 at that point because that's not their normal schedule. Again, complicated, confusing, but the key takeaway is to kind of match up the what the employee is working and keep in mind that you're capped at 80 hours. Um, and the there there are, of course, I mentioned the, the pay caps for these. Uh, under the Paid Leave Act, the Emergency Paid Leave Act, those reasons for leave that related to self-care, your own isolation order, your own sickness, seeking a diagnosis for COVID-19, you're capped at $511 a day or $5,100 total. Okay, and that's 100% of their uh, of their regular rate of pay calculation, okay, subject to that cap. For the reasons I mentioned that relate to care for someone else, care for a child or the school closure, or if there's some other reason that the government later specifies their kind of their their catch-all then it's a lower rate that you have to pay it's capped at 200 dollars a day 2000 total um that unless the government um except for the the reason number five you have a little bit higher uh because you, you you're you're going to be doubling up with that with the school closure you're you're also looking at the expanded medical leave act this is kind of where these laws intersect school closure they can get both the pay, emergency paid and the um, expanded FMLA. It's completely not confusing. I know, you know, it's it's not complicated at all. But this is what we're dealing with, and we have absolutely no regulations on this right now. Just sort of the text of the statute.
So there are a few other considerations, okay? Employee, employers are prohibited from requiring that someone cover, the, find someone to cover a shift or replace the employee as a condition of giving the sick pay. So, hey, I need to take two weeks off. You know, I'm under a, a quarantine order from my physician. The employer can't say, okay, well, you need to cover that shift. Under the law, you would be just required to give it to them and then kind of have to deal with finding a replacement yourself. <clears throat> the you also are not supposed to require other paid leave before the time um the leave of this act so in other words we get a lot of questions about you know my employees have pto uh can i make them burn through that before i have to worry about this law really the answer is supposed to be no you're supposed to give them the emergency paid sick leave first and as a practical matter if they are not exempt from this law in, in future regulations, you'd want to give them this leave first because at least it's federally subsidized. So they'll be taking leave on the government's dime rather than yours, which we'll talk about how that's calculated in a minute. Uh, but but I, I, I would caution you not to try to foist other leave time on. Another question we get a lot is, well, if, the, if people are on leave now because of all the stuff that's been going on, can we deduct it from this new law? And the answer to that is no, it's not retroactive. It doesn't start until April 1st. So whatever's happening this month is a completely separate issue than what's gonna happen uh, next month. With the exception that I mentioned at the beginning that if you have people who are on current FMLA, we have some open-ended questions with the government about that, but it doesn't look like they're gonna get you know, a, a ton of other time. Uh, but what that does mean is you can't say, I paid you PTO you know, between March 26th in April 1st, so I'm going to deduct that from your emergency paid sick leave. You can't do that. It's going to be a completely new leave entitlement as of April 1st. There's penalties for this. I, I'll note that for both the Fair Labor Standards or the um, the emergent, expanded FMLA and the emergency paid sick leave portion, the Department of Labor has said they're going to have a 30-day non-enforcement period for good faith compliance. They recognize they haven't issued regs. They recognize this is confusing. So as long as you're trying in good faith to comply with this law, they're not going to enforce it. But there are lots of lawyers out there. We all hate lawyers, right? And they these laws have individual rights of action. So even if the Department of Labor isn't going to do anything, it doesn't mean that your employees might not try to sue you. There's penalties for these provisions. Um, the penalties for the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act are the same as those under the Fair Labor Standards Act, which means you could get hit with a failure to pay minimum wage, uh, liquidated damages, double damages, attorney's fees, or, or injunctive relief, which is, you know, you need to cease and desist what you're doing and fix it right away. So there are, um, there are, there are potential issues with that. There's also a Department of Labor poster that just came out yesterday is available on their website. You're supposed to post and send to your employees so they have notice of these new laws um, and you know, you're supposed to follow kind of these these normal notice procedures so again there's multiple layers to this you've got the government saying 30 days not enforcement but you've got private individuals who can still sue you and um, it, we, we we've already seen lawsuits coming out of the COVID-19 crisis okay the just last week there was a lawsuit against the Detroit Zoo a manager there sued claiming that he was fired for after he refused to come to work because he was worried about being around large crowds at the zoo before everything closed down um you know so is that is that lawsuit going to be successful probably not but it's an example that that you have lawyers out there already just looking around trying to find people to, to file some kind of lawsuit uh, FMLA expansion and emergency paid sick leave working together. I mentioned a moment ago that, you know, if someone is taking leave to care for uh, a child due to the school closure, um, that's an area where these laws are going to intersect. Um, so then you're looking at a, a law that could cover part of those first 10 days and then the two thirds pay after. So that that could lead to, lead to you know, uh, really 12 weeks of paid leave for someone um, that that is going to be expensive um, but there are 
uh, go back to this. There are rules on how this is going to play out. Okay, um, so the 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 caps I mentioned, the two thirds expansion over ten weeks. The way this is supposed to work is you get a tax credit for this amount, and it's supposed to come out of payroll. Uh, so the paid leave provisions um, will would be essentially withheld from what payroll taxes you would normally pay an employee, including income tax, both the employer and employee share of Medicare and Social Security to cover whatever balance, to cover whatever money you're out paying the employee. You just keep that, what you would normally put down on their payroll taxes. So for practices with in companies with uh, large payroll liability, it may be essentially an immediate dollar for dollar um, offset on the leave that you're paying. If there's a balance, if there if it isn't a dollar for dollar offset, you're supposed to be able to get a tax credit uh, for that amount uh, on an expedited basis, which the IRS is saying will be a few weeks. Okay, but there are a lot of open questions. Okay. One of them is, what about intermittent leave? You know, with, if those of you have dealt with the Family Medical Leave Act in the past, you know that the bane of any HR person or employer's existence for Family Medical Leave Act is intermittent leave. People who can take one day here, one day there, a day one week, two weeks later take a day, reduce schedule. The regs and the statute are completely silent on whether intermittent leave is available. We have no idea. Um, so we're happy we have to wait till April to figure out if these leaves are going to be taken in a chunk you know the the two weeks 80 hours just okay you're you're off for your 80 hours or if they can take eight hours here another eight hours there uh, we don't know uh, the other another uh, unknown is uh, is is whether um, you know there's there's uh, going to be impact with layoffs right now so uh, furloughed employees are they still going to be on the books on April uh, on this time? Uh, we simply we simply don't know. So there's a lot of unknown questions. We will let you know um, when we see regulations. Uh, the tax cost issue we have slides that kind of go through some of the examples from the government. These are also available on the on the website um, on the Department of Labor website. So we won't spend too much time with them. The way unemployment works with this, they really don't work together. It, essentially, if you have people who are off work right now, furloughed, laid off, uh, they can apply for unemployment. And then after April 1st, it's really gonna depend on what the regulations say. So um, we also don't know what the expanded enhanced unemployment from the Sick Leave Act is gonna say, but or, or the stimulus bill is gonna say. Um, so there's, there's a lot of state law considerations that go into this as well. There's a paid medical leave act in Michigan that went into effect for some employers, again, that could provide additional time off. You're gonna have to just check your policies on whether you have PTO or paid uh, leave on that. Um, so, you know, another consideration for employers, that law really affected those with 50 or more employees. So you'll just have to go double check what, what your uh, paid medical leave policy is for that. Um, and you know, with with that, there's there's also different rules on how you want to do a carryover, how you want to front load all of these issues. These get into some very specific fact specific questions that we can answer for um, for accrual or front loading uh, methods. Uh, if you have questions, you know, contact your attorney because we're again getting into some specifics. And I know we're also running short on time in our our webinar. Um, we have we have notes on uh, as Deb had mentioned. There's different uh, issues on who can actually work and who has been exempted so far. Pregnant critical infrastructure workers are a question we get. Um, can we? You know, there's there's simply not a lot known uh, at this time, and so we you know we have different guidance on whether. Uh, pregnant women are either even at higher risk of COVID-19, but these are things. Th this is another issue to sort of just keep an eye on as we're talking about sick leave. 
And with that, we can also move on to how financial assistance can be given to small businesses during this time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Kirkland. Um, we'll speak a little bit about some of the small business uh, release sources that have stemmed from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Some of these resources were already, already available and some of these resources are brand new. So just a, as a caveat, um, some of the rules and procedures are still being developed. So if you seek any of these resources, uh, we just advise you to reach out to us, your attorney, your CPA, to see if there's any uh, reporting requirements on the back end. Um, so we'll begin. Um, just a quick overview. Um, so as many of you already know, uh, the federal COVID-19 economic stimulus package was officially passed by the Senate uh, late last night. Um, there's also the U.S. Small Business Administration Economic Injury Disaster Loan, uh, which is often referred to as the EIDL. Uh, just yesterday, uh, Wayne County and TCF Bank released a press release regarding their small business relief loan fund and the Michigan small business relief fund has been established. So some common themes you all may hear uh, during the next uh, couple minutes is the definition of small business and each loan or grant program has its own definition of small business for those that they deem eligible for these funds. Um, and also, you will, you will normally hear the ordinary costs of business or normal operational costs. So that typically refers to payroll expenses, rent, mortgage, and utilities. So just a quick overview of the Senate stimulus package. Um, and this some of this information is already slightly outdated. So uh, the Senate, they reached a deal yesterday, and the House could reach a deal as early as today or throughout the weekend. It is projected to provide now 2.2 trillion in economic relief uh, from the coronavirus, and that's the largest in American history. Some highlights for big businesses. Um, there is a $500 billion fund for corporations, state and local government. That's often been referred to as the slush fund. Uh, if you've been paying attention to the news. Uh, out of that 500 billion, 425 billion uh, will be sent to the Fed Reserve uh, to leverage loans to help a broad group of distressed companies. So we will be spending the next couple of days fully going through the text to see what the definition of distressed companies is. There's also uh, 75 billion for industry specific loans, and that's mostly for the travel industry, so airlines, cruises, other recreational type industries. The fund will also be overseen by a new inspector general and a five person panel appointed by Congress. And it will be run by the Treasury Department. So really we're looking at about $6.2 trillion of relief. Some highlights for healthcare and small businesses. Um, the bill is projected to provide $150 billion for hospitals and other healthcare providers for equipment and supplies. Again, the fine details as how that $150 billion will be allocated, how you can apply for it, uh, we will be learning in the next couple of days as people uh, break down the actual release text of the bill. And then another big piece is that $367 billion will be provided in federally guaranteed loans for small businesses uh, impacted by COVID-19. Uh, so this loan, typically they refer to a small business as one with less than 500 employees. Nonprofits are also eligible for the loans. The maximum loan amount is $10 million. And the big thing here is you can, cannot combine these loan funds with the EIDL which I will explain uh, a little bit later. And the uses for the funds include payroll, mortgage, rent, paid sick leave, uh, supply chain disruptions, and other debt obligations. So really your, your major operational costs. Oh, 
excuse me, I'm on that. One other big thing, I want to circle back for a second to mention in regards to the $367 billion, um, they're really encouraging small businesses to keep people on payroll at this time. Um, so with, if you receive funds um, from the COVID-19 stimulus package, um, empl employers that maintain their payroll levers, levels from a period of March 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2020, the portion of the loans used to cover the payroll will convert into grants. So you will not have to pay back that money. So really, you know, if you use that money for payroll, uh, it's almost like free money they're giving out. One second. Okay. So all their highlights of the stimulus package, um, it bans stock buybacks for anyone that accepts the government loan. So depending on your corporate governance structure, this is something to remember. And also in regards to individuals, it's going to provide direct payments to individuals and families that qualify. Moving into the uh, SBA economic injury disaster loans. So these loans were already available. However, with COVID-19, uh, the SBA has designated COVID-19 as a qualifying event to be eligible for the loans. Uh, the EIDL is a low interest fixed rate loan that can provide up to 2 million in assistance for a small business. Um, actual loan amounts will be based on the economic injury. So they're gonna look at your, your normal operating uh, costs prior the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and it's key to note it does not replace sales or loss or lost revenue so eligible business businesses include businesses directly affected by the disaster and that's very broad right now uh, businesses that offer services directly related to the businesses in the declaration and other businesses indirectly related to the industry that are likely to be harmed by losses in their community. So that's really referring to manufacturing and your supply chain. Now, businesses that qualify as a small business under the SBA uh, really refers to their table of size standards. So this will be important. Um, the definition of small business for the healthcare and social assistance industry, which is sector, sector 62, varies uh, and that really they're going to look at how you classify your business and I'll provide a few examples and it, it typically ranges from yearly receipts of 8 million to 45 to 41.5 million so for instance ambulance services a small business is considered as one that generates 16.5 million or less in yearly revenue general medical and surgical hospitals is 41.5 million or less. Emergency and other release services is 35 million or less. Dentist offices is 8 million or less. And the, your general physician office is 12 million or less. Some other things to note about the EIDL uh, when applying for loans greater than $25,000. The business will be required to provide collateral. Um, they will look at whatever is available as assets, including real estate. Loans under $25,000 can be unsecured. And the terms of the loans, uh, the interest will be 3.75% for small businesses and 2.575% for nonprofits. And there will be up to a 30 year uh, repayment term. Uh, I have provided the link for the application. Uh, yesterday, the link was down for maintenance. So I don't know if that means high traffic. Typically it does, but hopefully it will be back up soon. But that is the correct link. Moving on, um, as mentioned earlier, yesterday, Wayne County and TCF Bank announced that they have partnered to provide small business uh, loans. They're calling it the Small Business Relief Loan Fund. The loan eligibility, uh, it is businesses that have been established for at least one year, 
uh, their own credit approval guidelines would need to be met. Those were not published yesterday. Business sizes will include uh, businesses that have less than 100 employees or revenues less than or equal to $1 million per year. The business also must be located in Wayne County and obviously uh, impacted negatively by COVID-19. Some of the terms, the loans will be ranging from $5,000 to $50,000 with the 12 months repayment terms. The interest rate will be 2% or less, and the loan is to be secured by business collateral with guarantees by individuals with at least 20% ownership. And then lastly, um, we have the Michigan Small Business Relief Fund. This was created by the Michigan Economic Develop Development Corporation and the Michigan Strategic Fund is going to provide up to 10 million in small business grants and 10 million in small business loans for Michigan small businesses. It will be used for uh, working capital in the ordinary course of business. So again, uh, we're talking about mortgage payments, rent payments, payroll, utilities, etc. For the grants, um, they will be giving out $10,000 per business. And it must be an industry impacted by closure as a result of EO 2020-09 or an EO that was released after 2020-09. So 2020-09 specifically closed gymnasiums, fitness centers, rec centers, indoor sports facilities, indoor exercise facilities, exercise studios and spas. So if any of you are are in that business, uh, you can explicitly be eligible for the for the grant. Um, also, looking at EO 2020-17, which we discussed today, which applies to restrictions on non-essential medical and dental procedures, an argument can be made that you all apply, uh, are eligible. Also, EO 2020-21, which is the broad stay home, stay safe order, if your business closed due to that order, an argument can be made that you are eligible. So I will at least give an effort uh, to see if you qualify for the grants and loans. And then the loans are between 50,000 and 200,000 to eligible borrowers. Um, the terms of the loans can be found on the Michigan Economic Development Corporation website. Uh, we tried to keep it simple today explaining, but feel free to reach out to any of us if you have questions there. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and thank you to everyone that joined us. I see that we did go over our allotted time by four minutes. Um, as you can see, there was a ton of information to try to pack into this short period of time for the webinar. Um, unfortunately, we are not able to get to your questions. We do have those questions, and we have given you access to our contact information to the extent you would like to reach out to any of the panelists here, um, please do so. Or if you want to reach out to your regular Butzel attorney, they can also direct you to um, the proper person to answer your questions. I want to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. We hope that we were able to answer your more critical questions. Um, and we hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy and um, enjoying to the extent possible this time with their family and hopefully your businesses will sustain these times and we will get through them quickly. Again, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Deb, and, th and thank you everyone for attending today. We apologize for some of the technical difficulties we had during the presentation. Um, a copy of the presentation and the slides will be available later this afternoon on butzel.com on the webinar page. 
um, as well as the Butts Along COVID-19 Coronavirus Resource Center um, on Butzel.com. Thank you everyone for attending.